I think I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I did. I changed my title. I apologize uh, for that. I, I was. Uh, I had a grand plan, and then I realized that the talk was a bit shorter than I was uh, aiming for. So I uh, priors are in my talk, but they are sort of hidden. Um, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I'm, I'm happy to uh, be here in sp spirit, if not in person. And um, I'm going to tell you about uh, metric properties of neural representations. And um, my group in general is interested in how populations of neurons um, encode visual information and how that information, how those representations uh, enable or limit perception. And then also how we can use those uh, representations to improve engineered systems. And so today I'm going to focus on, um, on biology. And in particular, I'm going to kind of mostly be sitting on the second point, thinking about an enabling and limiting perception. But I'll, I'll get back to the first point um, uh, toward the end. And it'll be sort of sprinkled throughout the talk in any case. OK, so um, let's see. Oops, I skipped. I didn't, I didn't forward my, to my first slide. Here we go. Um, so it's now kind of a standard paradigm to think of the processing of visual information in a, in a cascade of, um, or a sequence of, of transformations. Um, I think about this as a sequence of information transformations. So even though the connectivity includes lots of recurrence and feedback, the information is propagated forward. Um, and the flow of information is, in a sense, feed forward, um, at least if you if you uh, believe that if, if you're thinking of studying um, visual perception, that is what we can learn from visual inputs. So given that um, uh, it's also now become a, a very standard paradigm, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, this was a, a kind of a slightly strange hypothesis or something that was considered far too simplistic. Uh, but these days, uh, I think it's pretty much taken for granted that we can think about the processing in these stages uh, as being somehow uh, canonical. That is, we can think of each stage. It's noted often that the circuitry, the, the architecture and circuitry in cortex looks very similar in different areas and even in different modalities, different parts of the cortex. And so the idea that um, things are canonical, that there's the same sort of little circuits that are computing the same basic functions with different parameters uh, throughout is, is, um, is, an, is an old idea, but one that is now, uh, again, sort of taken for granted um, in, with the, uh, in the era of deep nets. And, um, I just wanted to point out one thing. I mean, in this list of, of things that, that I would think of as canonical, linear filtering, rectifying, pooling, um, the two things at the bottom are, are usually not included in modern convolutional neural networks. Uh, they're used um, heavily in training those networks, but they're not really part of the network functionality. And I think, um, I think that's uh, a bit of a problem, certainly in terms of comparing to biology, because I think those two things are actually important uh, in, in terms of our understanding of biological systems. So just to, to elaborate on that a tiny bit, I don't have time to really go into any of the technical details, but I just want to give you sort of a picture of what, what I'm referring to. Um, many of you probably know that um, discriminability, perceptual discriminability, depends on both the nonlinearities of internal representations, but also on the noise properties. And this simple diagram kind of illustrates this. Uh, so there's a stimulus um, along, the, along the bottom here. Um, there's a, um, I'm forgetting how to, how to use this as a pointer, but that's okay. Um, there's a stimulus along the horizontal axis. Along the vertical axis is, um, is the response, uh, which I'm drawing probabilistically. It's a probability, conditional response, probability of uh, the response given the stimulus. And um, we, we often think of a sort of nonlinear function that maps something like the, the stimulus to something like the mean response. Uh, in fact, a lot of neuroscience and a lot of perception is built up on the idea of averaging over many presentations in order to extract that mean. That's what tuning curves are, for example. Um, but, um, but in fact, the internal response on a trial by trial or moment by moment basis is quite, is quite noisy. Um, and uh, our ability to discriminate stimuli uh, really comes down to a combination of, of that nonlinear function and the, the properties of the noise. And, you know, loosely speaking, signal detection theory would tell you that in a picture like this, uh, your discriminability has to do with um, how, how wide the noise is, the standard deviation of that noise. Uh, something like that, uh, maybe the slope of that uh, mean response curve divided by the width of that noise might, might give you something like the, your sensitivity. Um, because the slope of this function tells you about the, the mapping, 
to the sort of the tells you about the change of the mean response as a function of stimulus. And then the width is important because it tells you basically how far you have to move in order to discriminate things. Okay, so th these are these are all then very classical ideas. Um, they can be found um, in um, literature on signal detection that goes back to the 1950s. Um, and, and those can be seen as a, a can be formalized and even generalized using Fisher information, uh, which allows you to, to think about internal representations and internal noise that are not Gaussian and, and that can be quite complicated. Um, luckily, um, this also generalizes to um, multiple dimensions. So if you have a stimulus in a high dimensional space here, just drawn as two dimensions in a pixel space, um, that gets mapped to some internal population code, which is also again noisy. And that in turn um, induces uh, an understanding of, or, or actually constrains our, our ability to discriminate stimuli. Discrimination in a high dimensional space, of course, is not a number, it's not a threshold, it's a surface, uh, which we often depict or approximate as being elliptical. So there's an ellipsoidal uh, surface around any stimulus that describes basically how far you have to go in stimulus space in order to tell the difference between the base stimulus and, uh, and the perturbed one. Okay, so this idea, these ideas I probably are familiar to many, many of you. And um, what I want to do is to think about um, this discriminability, and in particular, I'll be using Fisher information. Under the hood, I'll be using Fisher information, but I'm not going to give you um, the technical aspects of that. Um, the discriminability provides a sort of metric um, that can be used to characterize and compare neural systems and models. And um, so how are we going to do that? So I'm, I'll give you just two examples. Um, so in the, in the first one, uh, what we're going to do is um, use models, we'll use the metric properties. It's hard to get the metric properties of the visual system, although that will be my second example. My first example is that I'm going to use the metric properties of models where we understand exactly what the computation is um, to calculate um, stimuli, and then we can use the stimuli um, in human, human perceptual experiments or in physiological experiments for that matter. Okay, so what's the idea? Um, it's actually um, simply the idea that um, once you've got a metric back in the stimulus space for discriminability, um, this is a high dimensional space. You can't possibly probe that in an experimental paradigm. Measure stimuli in all possible directions in pixel space, which is very, you know, it's hundreds or hundreds of thousands of dimensions or maybe millions of dimensions if you have a large image. Um, so what you have to do instead, or what we did instead, was to um, query the, a model and ask, what are the directions in stimulus space that are most discriminable? That is, what are the directions that, um, in, that involve the least amount of, of uh, moving around in order to get to, the, to a discrimination um, threshold? And what are the directions that are least discriminable? So um, indicated on the diagram are for this two-dimensional case, uh, the two directions that are that are most and least discriminable in this two-dimensional uh, problem. There's really only there's only two dimensions. There are two axes. Those are the prime the primary axes of this ellipse. In a million-dimensional space, there are a million axes, and what I'm referring to are the extremal axes. That is the one that has the the shortest distance, the shortest width of the ellipse, uh, versus the one that has the longest. And those two are the important ones in a sense because they bound, they're the extrema for all the others. And so in a sense, what we can do is query the model and ask it to hand us two stimuli that are relevant and, and, and can, can be, um, that, that the model believes are the most, the most extreme in terms of visibility. And then we can ask a human, how visible are those stimuli? And then we can use this to compare different models. So let's go ahead and look at how that works out. I'm going to um, start with a really simple model. So this is, this is um, a, a very simple model for the front end of the visual system. It's really based on uh, um, work by Valerio Monte, who spoke either earlier or after me. I can't remember in the in this meeting. Um, and um, it's a it's a very simplified model that just does center surround filtering, local gain control. And that's what these um, these little loops are with the division signs. Local gain control by the mean uh, mean intensities. Um, and then another gain control for the contrast. So there's a, there's a sort of squaring nonlinearity, again, a pooling, and then a square root. And we divide by that again, and that gives us contrast normalization. And at the end, there's an accelerating nonlinearity that generates the responses. So this is a, think of this as a simple model for the, you could use this for the retinal, retinal ganglion cells or for the LGN. Um, and there are on and off cells in this. So there's two, two channels. 
Okay, so um, what do we do with this model? Well, we're going to compare it to two other models. Uh, the other two models are um, a deep net uh, VGG16. So this is a, a sort of classic deep net that's trained for object recognition. Uh, it's extremely good at that task. What we're going to do in, in this case is, um, so for the, for the, the ganglion cell model, we're going to assume uh, something really simple. We're going to just assume essentially, um, we're going to assume a Gaussian additive noise at the end of the model, and that will give us these um, eigen these eigen directions. It'll give us the Fisher information. We'll be able to, to factorize that and get the eigen directions, the most and least discriminable directions. Um, we're, for VGG16, we're going to take the um, we're going to have 13 parameters that are just going to compute a weighted mean squared error across 13 stages of this of this um, deep net. So there are 13 parameters to control the 13 weights. In that LGN model, there are 12 parameters that control things like the pooling, the size of the pooling regions, and the um, uh, ratio of, of center to surround strength, and a few other things. Okay, so these are about the same number of parameters, these two models. And then we'll also compare this to a generic uh, convolutional neural network that has about um, nearly half a million parameters. Um, we train each of these models on a database of human perceptual ratings. So this is a database where humans um, look at images and their distorted counterparts, and they rank them or rate them um, in terms of how bad the errors are uh, so, or how visible the errors are. And um, we, it's a pretty large database. It's enough to train that the, the generic CNN on the right and also, of course, to train the other two uh, models that are listed here. And what happens when you train these three models on this task, uh, on explaining that uh, database of human, human uh, responses, is that you find that the models are just about equally good at describing the training data. So it's a tie. Uh, essentially, you can see there's a slight difference. The CNN is a little bit better. Uh, these are all cross-validated um, uh, 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 correlations with the data. You can see that it's it's basically a tie. Mean squared error, error does pretty poorly, and these three models all do quite well, uh, up around 80% correlation. So we might stop there, but what we really want to know is how well they generalize, and we're going to do that by generating, taking each model, asking it to generate best and worst case, its prediction for best and worst case distortions. And then we can test those by doing human psychophysics, which we did, and, and I'm going to show you um, examples that are averaged over 19 human subjects. Um, and we can compare the models based on how strongly, uh, how easily perceived the uh, most discriminable um, errors are and how difficult it is to perceive the least discriminable errors according to each model. So let's just look at what the data look like. So um, in this first example, uh, so we can calculate, so if we just use mean squared error as a metric, we can think of that as a model, a sort of straw man model. Mean squared error performs quite poorly in explaining human data, um, but you can still ask what are the perceptual thresholds responding to mean squared error. This is essentially equivalent to taking each of these each of the images you're going to run on and adding white noise and asking what's the threshold, how much how much white noise do I have to add for it to be reliably seen, and you can get a threshold out of that. And here it it looks like it's around uh, something like two. Don't worry about the units here. This is just a log axis of how strong the stimulus has to be for you to see it. So our, our observers um, require a threshold of around two to see white noise. Um, when, we, uh, when we use the least noticeable eigen distortions from each of the models, which are actually shown here as images, so this is, a, this is for a parrot image, we ask each model to say what's the, what's the least noticeable noise that can be injected into this image that will uh, not be seen by the model. And um, what you can see is that the, the two neural networks produce something that looks kind of like white noise. The on-off model, the, the retinal or ganglion cell model that I showed you, produces something that's where the noise is actually carefully sculpted and crafted to lie in regions where, um, where there are high contrast things going on. And that actually masks the noise and makes it difficult to see. You can see that reflected in the human data. So the on-off model has very high thresholds, uh, whereas the CNN and the VGG uh, model have thresholds that are actually close to the white noise. Um, so, that on-off example is very difficult to see. We have to make it really large for humans to notice it. Um, it's basically like a factor of 10 larger um, in terms of amplitude. Okay, so that works well on the least noticeable distortions. It also works well, um, the, the LGN model works well on the most noticeable distortions. So if we generate those, here's what they look like. 
Um, unlike that sort of diffuse noise that was produced in the previous examples, you can see that all, for all three models, they now try to concentrate, make very, very high contrast localized um, errors. And those are uh, predicted by each of these models to be very visible. And in fact, uh, what happens here is again, the on-off model, the LGN model, actually produces something that is more noticeable by humans in our, in our uh, experiments and by a pretty substantial margin. So you can see that the, for the on-off model, the data point that's plotted there in the bottom of the uh, listed under on-off is, um, is quite, is well, well, um, is much more visible than white noise. So we're talking about an order of uh, almost, again, a factor of 10. Um, whereas the CNG, the VGG model are also uh, more noticeable but not nearly as much as the uh, on-off model. Okay, so that's the basic uh, result. And the interesting thing is that if we take that LGN model and we kind of peel off components of it and we ask, well, what matters here in that model? Does it matter that it's two channels? If we, if we go back to a single channel, does that, does that perform about the same? And you can see in this box, the thing on the right is the full on-off model. The LGG model is if I just go back to a single, um, single channel with gain control uh, and nonlinearities. If I go to the next one over, it uh, it's, it's removes the contrast normalization, but it still has the uh, luminance normalization. And then the other two mo the models to the left of the box, uh, the LN model is just a simple linear followed by nonlinear model. It's sim the simplest model you can make for a, a, a retinal neuron, the center surround followed by rectifier, and then MSE on the left. What you can see is that um, the really good performance comes uh, when you add gain control. So the gain control nonlinearities seem to matter for this problem. Uh, they give us much more, uh, much more powerful predictions of what will be easily or not easily seen by humans. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's what I wanted to tell you about that. Let me show you another example. So in that example, um, what we're doing, uh, remember what we're doing is using the metric properties of the model to sim generate stimuli, and then we're testing the stimuli on human observers. What we would rather do is somehow test directly the metric properties of the human visual system. And so we've been thinking about how to do that for quite a long time. It's difficult because again, very high dimensional space, very high dimensional population representation, high dimensional stimulus space. Uh, but we landed on, a, on an idea that, um, that sort of turned into a method for doing this. And the idea is, is actually quite simple. It's based on a hypothesis that it's, it's related to, but, but not quite the same as uh, Jim DiCarlo and uh, Jim DiCarlo's um, hypothesis about, about um, flattening. So the idea is that um, um, ob in, in Jim's work, the objects uh, of the same category, images of objects of the same category um, are, are um, transformed by the visual system to lie in, let's say, linear spaces where they can be easily separated from each other. Here, the idea is that um, we're not talking about objects here. What we say is that the, the temporal evolution of visual scenes, um, as you walk around and move around the world, uh, your visual input um, follows very complicated trajectories. Even if something is just translating, the actual trajectory in pixel space is a very com complicated and, and uh, curvy trajectory. What your visual system does is it tries to make predictions about what is coming next and to anticipate things. In, in order to do so, it transforms that, represent, that input into a representation which is straighter and more predictable. So that's the, that's the hypothesis. We call it the, the temporal straightening hypothesis. And in order to test that, we, we, we did a lot of things trying to generate geodesics from models. Similar to the previous example, the idea was to generate stimuli and then test those um, based, uh, generate predictions from models and then test those. But then we realized that we could actually do something more direct. And the direct thing is to measure the curvature, to attempt to measure the curvature, the internal curvature of the representation of a visual sequence um, inside the human brain. We're not going to do that with electrodes. We're going to do that by asking people to judge psychophysically in an experiment um, how far apart the, the different frames are, how different they are. We're going to ask them to discriminate them. And by getting pairwise distances between all the frames, we can actually const constrain the geometry enough to get a good estimate of the curvature of that internal representation. We don't know where it is because we're just asking people to judge dis differences of or similarities of images. We don't know what part of their brain they're using. We have some idea of how that works in the visual system, but we don't know how they're making their final judgments. Nevertheless, we can get an estimate of the, of the, in the curvature of their internal representation. So how does this work? I'm going to skip past a couple of slides in the interest of time. 
So this is just a slide about estimating curvature. This is a slide about how we do the psychophysics and how we estimate the curvature from the psychophysics. As I told you, what we're going to do is measure essentially pairwise distances between frames. That's illustrated in the upper right-hand corner, where you have frame number against frame number, and the intensity of each square indicates the proportion correct in a human that has to tell the difference between the two frames. What they really have to do is they have to choose one. They, they get to see uh, three instances of frames uh, two of them are the same, one is different, they have to pick the outlier. So if they can tell the difference, then they're going to give us a reliable answer, a high proportion correct. So that pattern of answers allows us to establish some sort of a distance metric in, the in their internal representation, and that in turn allows us to estimate curvature. Okay, so what happens when we do this? Um, here's natural movies frames from natural movies, it turns out, are perceptually straightened as we hypothesized. So on the left is, uh, up at the top, is are just three frames from a movie, a uh, first one, a middle one, and a last one. The actual curvature in the image domain projected down onto two dimensions is, is quite high and is shown on the, on the left and the plot on the bottom. The curvature perceptually is actually close to straight, uh, um, and it's shown here in two dimensions, but we do all the calculations in, in, a, in the full dimensional space. And when we do this over many videos and uh, for many human subjects, we get a distribution of curvature changes, which are quite significantly uh, downward. That is, we get a reduction of curvature. It doesn't always become straight, but we get a large reduction in curvature um, in the human representation of these, of these uh, uh, movie frames. If we do a, a control experiment, just to make sure that nothing weird is happening here, we generate movies now, the artificial movies, that are uh, linear interpolations between the first and last frames. So these are just basically fading from one frame to another. And so by definition in the pixel domain, that's a straight line. We're literally, every pixel is just fading, uh, ramping from one value to, to in the first image to another value in the last image. The entire thing in the high dimensional space is actually following a straight line. So by definition, the curv curvature is zero in the pixel domain. But now it turns out that the curvature in the perceptual domain is quite high, uh, even higher than, quite a lot higher than it was in the previous examples. And you can see that um, in the plot on the right, which is, again, average uh, the, the distribution of results that we get over, over all of our observers and over all the image sequences that we've tested. OK, so we get a, a big increase in, in curvature here. We get a large decrease in curvature uh, for the natural uh, images, uh, the natural sequences. Um, so the, the results are summarized in this plot. So on the left is the curvature in the pixel domain. We're, we're, relative, we're, we're, we're plotting here everything relative to the pixel domain. So that's 0. And on the right is what we get out of human perception. I didn't show you the middle control experiment, which is a contrast fade, so don't worry about the red point. Just look at the green and the blue at the top and the bottom. Those are the artificial one, which increases in curvature, and the natural one, which decreases in curvature. That's the blue one at the bottom. Um, and if we actually simulate some simple models, uh, we can see uh, models like the LGN model I just showed you. Uh, and if we tack on to that a V1 model that includes uh, a sort of description of complex cells, uh, we can we can actually see that this sort of straightening property starts to emerge from the basic nonlinear properties of these simple front end models, and we can see it goes in the right direction. And in fact, it gets these the trajectories get straighter as we go from LGN to V1 uh, models, and they're not quite up to the level of human perception. But then again. We don't think that human perception ends at V1. We think that the, the responses that people are giving are probably coming from later parts of cortex uh, and decision centers eventually. OK, so we think we have a pretty good sense of this. And just, to, just as a little side remark, um, this is something where deep neural networks really fail pretty badly. We tried actually a number of standard um, deep neural networks. And, uh, and found that they don't produce this kind of straightening at all. This is probably related to the existence of adversarial examples that Andreas was talking about. Um, they have basically, um, they're well constrained on the stimuli they're trained on and stimuli that are similar to the ones they're trained on, but they actually do not really cover the stimulus space very well, not in terms of these sort of metric properties. And so what you can see is that at all layers of VGG, if you ask, is there any straightening? Um, in fact, uh, you never get straightening. Um, for all of the stimuli that I showed you and talked about, um, you actually get increases in curvature, sometimes quite dramatic. So this really looks nothing like the pattern that we see in the human observers. And um, uh, we think that that's, well, that was the point that I made at the beginning, that, that, that those properties about nonlinearities and noise 
are actually quite important for, um, for the visual system and I think for biology in general. And they're not represented in current deep nets. Um, and so that's why standard deep nets don't have the right behaviors in terms of the metric properties. Okay, um, and one last note, um, I, it's quite timely. Uh, literally yesterday, uh, uh, this paper just came out. So we have been doing the same experiments. Now, instead of on human observers, we've been looking at populations of neurons recorded simultaneously and jointly in uh, awake behaving macaque monkeys. And we have been uh, working in that high dimensional space. Typically we have on, on the order of uh, 50 to 100 neurons. Um, in a population, and we're looking at the curvature of their responses. This is a much harder problem in, our, in terms of actually doing the estimation of curvature because the responses are very noisy, and we have to actually include a model of the noise that, include, that, that has both the sort of Poisson-like nature of neural responses, but also includes uh, the joint modulatory uh, properties of, of neurons and the fact that they have correlated, uh, correlated noise in their responses. So I'm not going to be able to walk you through the details of that, but since the paper just went online literally yesterday, uh, you can look it up if you are interested. Uh, the bottom line is uh, the result is quite consistent with the perceptual result that I showed you already. Uh, natural movies are straightened. Their curvature is reduced by, uh, by neural populations. Here, what's shown on the left are seven different populations and the reduction that we have um, across all the natural movies that we tried. And next to that, um, is just an illustration that actually this does vary across the movies. Different movies show different amounts of straightening. Um, and what you see for the on the right is for the unnatural movies, the same control I told you about where we just fade from first to last uh, frame. Um, the <clears throat> neural populations also increase the curvature. They do not, uh, they, know, they can't decrease the curvature because it's, it's zero, but they produce a substantial increase in curvature. And that also varies a bit across movies. Okay. So that's, um, that's all I wanted to tell you. Uh, I wanna thank my co-authors who are shown here on the slide and also the people that provided the money and thank you all for your attention and listening. And, um, and I, uh, I, I'm sorry to be taking up your lunchtime. Um, thanks.